comes to finances and today we're looking at how to build financial literacy in your marriage a very very key and pivotal topic how to build financial literacy in your marriage i'm mr charles here with me in the studio to shed more light on that situation over to you mr charles yes, thank you you see i um, financial literacy has become a very important issue not only in marital life but in our individual life so and if you recall or you look at it there is no course <laughs> that they teach you money yeah. management in marriage there, there, there is no course they, they don't teach it you know so people come out even when you go for marriage counseling they don't teach you for, um, um, finance in marriage they don't teach you so that's why we are saying there are some marital problems you have yes your marriage counselor they will do their best and that's why it is people like us who are now a financial therapists, financial planners, were now forced to begin to learn about marriage before I used to shy away because I felt I didn't have enough training as a marriage counselor. But I now see that with my financial experience, talking to young people, talking to couples about their finances, I now felt I need to go deeper. And that is why I had to go through the program. I wouldn't say I'm an expert marriage counselor, but I would say I'm still learning, but I think I have that uh, skill now to talk to young couples when it comes to their finances. And the, the, each spouse in that marriage must be willing and ready to compromise to ensure that the marriage works in terms of finance. You know, the first thing we talk here about is uh, financial infidelity. That first principle, you must be open when it comes to finances in your marriage. Now, the issue of financial literacy is not only in marriages. Some persons will even have PhD in finance, but I'm telling you they are not financially literate. We have said uh, the illiterates of the 21st century are not those who cannot read or write, <laughs> are those who cannot unlearn, learn and relearn. So you might think, oh, I did economics, oh, I did finance. I'm telling you, when it comes to marriage finance, you can still be an illiterate. So that is why in our counseling business, when we see people who come with that ego, we say, no, 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 no. This is not corporate finance. This is finance in marriage. It is personal finance. And you must be that literate for you to understand some of the things. So today we're going to be talking about how to build that financial literacy in your marriage. Okay, so it is still Broad Street Radio. We are talking about how to build financial literacy in your marriage. So how should couples start the conversation about shared financial goals? You know? <laughs> It is um, amazing to see the range of emotions that arise from this simple question. How do you relate with money? When it comes to money, how? What emotions, you know, come over you when you talk about mar uh, finance in your marriage? Often people are fighting old, old battles of their parents and carrying around emotional baggage that doesn't even belong to them. Like we have said, yourself and your spouse you are from different background your his financial background is different from yours and so two of you will relate differently when it comes to money issues it's for you to understand first of all once you understand his background he understands your own background then two of you can say okay we want to now to become financially literate when it comes to finances in our marriage and you must be ready to learn you must be ready to compromise you know, so once you know your the history with the issue with money, the obvious next question is, what do you want your money to do for you? Yes, and I keep saying it. Each time you look at two couples, they want to go for divorce, separation. The underlying issue there is finance. Over ninety percent of couples is finance, and we have seen couples even kill. Oh, my spouse has uh, an insurance policy. Is better dead than being alive. And you begin to wonder. These are persons who have gone to the altar and have said, "I, I do. do." So why do you want to take 
your, your spouse life because you have seen that uh, and of course trust the insurance company they will do their due diligence at the course. end of the day it become an oversight case so are you looking for peace of mind security greater wealth compared to your friends or family that are couples like that my parents at least I want to be better than them they are not competing with everybody everybody have their own race they are running okay so do you prefer to travel or material things there are some uh, spouse they want a very big house and we have advised them you have this big house children one day the children will leave the house will become too big for you to maintain like they, they like um uh, the foreign people like in the u.s they call you now become an empty nester exactly. an empty nester exactly. <laughs> so why not stay in functional homes functional mm. homes that even when the children have now all gone you know to start their own life it should not be a big problem for you and your spouse okay so start a big one and there is no right answer you know anyway it depends on them um, each individual but what the advice we are giving is stay in a very functional house do not be too uh, affluent but of course if that is what makes you happy but we are saying you have to look at the future when you are doing some of these things so the point is to build a framework for understanding both partners feelings and expectations when it comes to money you need it's very key you need to understand your partner's feelings and especially when it comes to money so you see believe me they have plenty of opportunities to discuss day-to-day -day issues bridges up you know savings for retirement savings for college children education you know have you written a will or not all these are discussions that you need to be open and learn so much about it when it comes to your spouse so the, those conversations will be more productive if you have that original framework of understanding that is the most important thing you must be willing to understand where your partner is coming from so we'll take the first point talk about your financial goals I mean you you, you can't as a spouse you plan your financial goals without your other spouse yeah it's not possible two of you have become one so you must talk about your financial goals you have to save for retirement you have to plan for your children's education you, you have to do things together you plan for vacation together so you have to talk about your financial goal so I think it is important for couples to pre-commit to a general goal for saving can you both agree to save 10 to 12 percent of your total income in good and not so good time of course i have recommended you on this uh, series that 10 percent is okay but if you can do more fine so say it out loud to each other and write it down an early saving habit can make a huge difference in your life choices and overall happiness many years later so savings is an habit you just have to cultivate that savings habit. If I agree 10%, make sure no matter what happens, you save that 10% in your life. Gradually to pay the bills with nothing in your savings account can drain the energy and time that should be going to your spouse and kids. If that if you have not been saving, okay? So couples should try to talk at least once each year about their total financial picture without interruption. In fact, you make it more awful. Every quarter, you talk about your financial future, your financial picture, what you want your finances to be when you are going to retire. You must plan for it. Yes, fine, in Africa, yeah, we depend on children, but I'm saying, and I'm telling you, children, <laughs> with due respect to them, they are the least set of people you will rely on. Because at that point in time, they are also struggling to start their family. It just reminded me of, I, I, yesterday I talked about this um, book that was adapted into a series. The title of the book is Smart Money Woman okay, Smart by Aresia Ugu. So they made it into a seven part series. It's okay, on Netflix. Yeah. And this particular topic you just raised, one of the characters talked about it, said that 
uh, time has gone beyond when parents see their children as their backup or retirement plan. And not that he's saying that is entirely wrong yeah, it's entirely for wrong. you to yes. assist your parents when yeah. they are older, but that it may be that when you get to your peak, no, it may be that when you get to your I'm forgetting the particular term we use. Like when you go to that stage where you can no longer work, it yeah. might be the the time when your child is just trying to, you know, come up, come up. Yes. financially. Exactly. And they may not be readily available to do all the things that you expect. That's and true. that's where a lot of people, a lot of parents become disappointed that's and true. they start lashing out at their kids. That's true. You, you understand? Yeah, and it starts uh, creating family reads exactly. and things like that. Yeah. So we should, as a couple, plan for our financial goals. Okay. So I am not talking about having a conversation on the way you to a volleyball tournament or at the kitchen table while the kids are running around. Cover an hour or two. Quiet time. Talk about your plan next for the next 12 months or even three years. So you should have it. I call it a strategic session. Don't like companies do. They talk about what they want to do, about their finances, their human resource. So couples too should find out time, you know, where they talk, quality talk about their financial life for the next one year, for the next three years, the next five years. You should find the time where you talk about it seriously. Not just casual talk or when the woman is there at the kitchen doing one to the other, you are there just talking. No, where both of you are fully concentrated and you are talking. So give each spouse some homework before you talk. Check on your various types of insurance. Look at your portfolio. Talk about your will. Check to see how much you spend and save the prior 12 months. So you need to take an appraisal. Look at, that is why budget is very important. If you have your budget, the actual and the budget, you see, okay, this is where I, I spend so much. And you'll be able to correct yourself. You know, in account, they call that uh, variance analysis, where you have the actual and the budget. You now see what caused that difference, you know. So you just have to be focused. See, talk about your will. You should not be afraid of talking about your will because either party can be called upon at any time by the, the good Lord. So don't be afraid. Just have the interest of your spouse at the back of your mind. Beware of each other's debts. Yes, if your partner has taken a mortgage loan, Beware of that debt. Two of you should jointly carry the debt together. If one spouse has um, a certain loan from the office, make sure the other spouse is aware. So each of you will be aware of each other's debt. It goes a long way to even make the marriage to be more closer and you bond very well. People should wait to get married until they are both debt free. Do we, do you suggest that? <laughs> it's not possible. It's not possible. We all come with our own issues. Okay. That's great in theory, but not so easy in practice. You know? So I have student loan. Maybe we don't have that much in a, in our client yet. But you can be indebted to some family members that have assisted you. And they are way, they are even expecting you to do same for their own children. So for me, that is also a debt, okay? So student exiting college, exiting college, have more debt than they did when I, when I was in school some decades ago, you know, where things were a little bit easier compared to when it is now. People are also married later in life now, so they may be in their 30s and already have houses, cars, those large but you usually come with some debt attached. You know, somebody can be working in a company and they say, okay, they're giving you a car, giving you a house. That car, you are paying gradually for it. It's a debt. So when you now get married, allow your spouse to be aware of that. You know, like people will say, bankers, oh, they are living on loan. That's what people will say. But when you now get married, whether you are the male or the female, you are the banker, let your spouse be aware. Now this car you see me drive, oh, it's on loop and I'm paying, you know, right. gradual every month. And even the house, it's on mortgage, you know.
know. So we need to understand this very well for us to continue. And that is making you to become financially literate in your marriage. Because you understand these little, little finances about debt, about budget, about mortgage, you know, about investment, you begin to understand. So we often hear the message that debt is bad, but I don't really agree hundred percent of the time. You there are certain debts you need to take for I me, mean, like your mortgage. Because we have been told here that mortgage is an investment, while your rent is an expense. So it's better to be paying mortgage and maybe after 20 25 years the house become your own. That to be paying rent every year, even if you pay rent for 30 years, the house is still not your own. So couples, spouse should begin to understand this. So access to financing allows people to spread their consumption over their lifetime and from an economic perspective, that can be a good thing. Yeah, you can take um, mortgage loan. Your greatest any potential will likely occur 20 to 25 years after your initial need for those first big purchases like a car or a house. Debt allows you to make those large investment earlier in your career, you know. I mean, uh, while I worked in a mortgage firm, I would be willing to go all, do all I can to ensure that young couples get that uh, mortgage loan. Because they have 20, 25 years ahead of them. And that is the best time for them to have a mortgage loan. So consumer debt, however, is a minute, you know. You can't take a loan to buy a flat screen television. <laughs> I would not encourage that, <laughs> you know. But I would encourage you to take a mortgage loan for a property, you know. Mortgage loan for a property. But to take, that's consumer debt now, to buy a, a flat screen television, theater, or they could do 20, home theater. Home theater. I would not encourage that. <laughs> But people do it okay so using your cards for consumption portrait like shopping eating out and travel could significantly limit your ability to do those things in future years so we have to be cautious of our spending habits okay it's important to know what kind of debt your mate brings to relationship we have said that yes yeah, so you better know uh -huh. if is it consumer debt or is it debt from a responsible car or house? I qualify the car purchase with responsible because it makes sense to be driving a, a, luxury, a luxury car when you are living on an entry level salary. Does it make sense? You want to drive the latest car when you have just started work. Does it make sense? Okay. So we will talk about something called conspicuous consumption. You are trying to make a statement or get notice with your purchases. That conspicuous consumption. And you should be able to afford those things without using credits to get them. If you want to drive a very expensive car when you just start working, or maybe your parents are supporting you, that's good. But not to get it using a uh, consumer loan. It is not advisable. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I've seen two people who start work. One came from a very rich family and they said, no, you can't be driving this type of car. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you have that kind of opportunity, there's nothing wrong with that. But for you as a normal couple, please don't start your life trying to drive the latest luxurious, uh, luxury car. Just go for a type of car that you can maintain. Know what works for you. You have to know what works for you. Should couples combine their finances? There is no single answer to mm -hmm. this one. I have seen couples who have been married for 30 plus years and keep everything separate. I've also met a lot of couples who combine everything before they were married. Again, I would not support you uh, combining your finances. Like we have said, you should have an account for the house. The two of you can have your separate uh, accounts. I'll say we are more young. I've seen more young couples choosing not to blend their finances nowadays. Yes, but when it comes to household budgeting, there should be one budget. With internet banking and modern financial tools, it's really, it really shouldn't matter. Every couple should be unique. Find a system that works best for two of you. 
So don't say because my parents had joint account and they lived, they, they were married for over 40 years, you want to follow the same. Each couple is unique and look for what suits both of you before you can embark on it. Have a fair expense strategy. How should couple decide who pays for what? That's also very... Anyway, they will say it's on Africa. The man knows that he's the head of the house. Is that also? Yes. Well, we also say that the neck is also very important. Without the neck, the neck... Without, without the, the neck, neck, the head will not stand. stand. Okay. So I think uh, it is something both couples should sit down and discuss and say, okay, what, what can I do? What can you do? Again, I don't think there is a single answer to this question either. I've seen couples split everything right down to the middle and just about every other type of arrangement. Some split the big bills like the house, the car, college debt, while others divide responsibility by what they brought into the marriage. I don't think that will suit you. Uh -huh. So because in this in this part of the world, things are changing. We don't have people who are saying who are full house type wives. We don't have that in there. Everybody has to work. Have something to have something. Even if you are a sit at home mom. Yes, after you have drawn the children, there are things you can begin to do. Yeah. So I think have a fair expense strategy. Two of you don't say, oh, you, you pay school fees, I will pay house rent. Everything should be done jointly. Okay? You are not saying, oh, you are the man, you are the head of the house, provide for your family. We agree. But that support must also be there. You can also split the bills based on your relative earnings or when you get paid. Like I've always used myself as an example. Growing up, I saw my father doing most of the things. But there are other little, little things in the house which are very important. It is the wives that will do it. So the man comes, he knows he has to pay the school fees, he has to pay the mortgage, pay the house rent. But little, little things in the house, the wife can also begin to do it. Yes, uh, time will not permit us, but we'll still look at these few points. Hire a financial planner. There is nothing wrong when you're having issues in your marriage in terms of your finance. There's nothing wrong for you to seek the help of a financial planner. Because he comes with his own experience, not biased, and be able to advise the couples what they can do to improve their finances. So don't be shy. Don't say no. I work in the bank. Oh, I know about finance. No. That is quite different from your personal finance. So you hire a financial planner. How can couples handle a financial dispute relationship? Hmm. I can offer some general advice based on my own personal experience. And I have seen with clients over the last 20 years we have been talking to marriage couples. You must first find a you must first you must find a way to acknowledge and appreciate your spouse perspective. The disagreements I have seen are usually about the level of risks each spouse wants in their portfolio. How much stock or bonds? So in fact I've seen a couple where the woman was buying shares, the man is not aware. And where she now had issues with the stockbroker she can no longer hide it she has to now open up and the man said okay you've been buying this amount of shares i am your husband i'm not aware i want to go to that stockbroking firm and i'm going to make trouble with them of course out of ignorantly he went there and started causing commotion again that is financial infidelity the wife will have informed the husband that look I am buying these shares and let two of them agree. However, some persons will tell me, no, the man might be his own money personality, he's spending, spending. He might not want to encourage her to be doing that kind of uh, investment. But we are saying you need to understand where your spouse is coming from. Yeah, so some people are natural risk takers, others are not. So having a financial planner facilitates the discussion, often helps couples to find a happy middle ground. And I think you can also work it out yourself. Okay, so get a financial advisor that can lead to the acknowledgement and position of each viewpoint 
that's so important to a healthy discussion. Always ensure that you are open to learning, you are open to understanding where your spouse is coming from, taking the advice of the financial advisor. And money discussions often include a lot of emotional baggage. If you have a third party, I think it gives a better perspective as to what is happening. So make sure you use the services of a financial planner and you begin to see how it will improve your financial literacy in your marriage. I will stop here maybe another day. We'll look at, we'll continue, we'll look at plans for retirement. Thank you. All right, uh, that wraps up the Investor Education Series for today. As well as the Afternoon Business Show, join us at 4 p.m. for the Nigeria Stock Market Callover.